Hi, this is Dr. Lauren Lernan, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the viruses. We're going to talk about what a virus is and some aspects of its size, the general structure of viruses and the variants within types of viruses, a little bit about their life cycles and the basic patterns to look for in those, means by which viruses can be classified, We'll think about the different hosts for viruses and what the term viral life cycle means. And I'm going to introduce you guys to the idea of the Baltimore classification system. So a virus can be defined as an obligate intracellular parasite. Obligate means has to be, and in this case, this means has to be inside a cell in order to be living, the host cell. Intracellular means inside cells. And parasite means a relationship between two creatures where one benefits and the other is harmed. That may not necessarily always be true, and it may simply be that we're more aware of the viruses that act as parasites, <clears throat> less aware of the ones that live within us that do not harm us. Viruses have genomes that are organized into chromosomes, and they have protein coats. They do not have cytoplasm, a cell wall, cell membranes, or organelles of any sort. When they are in their extracellular stage, they're inert or inactive. They behave simply as particles, and they are called virions. There are two stages to every virus. There is the stage wherein it is simply a particle exterior to a host cell, in which case it is considered inert or inactive and called a virion. And then it is considered to be an actively replicating virus when it is inside a host cell actively replicating. When it comes to viruses and their hosts, specificity matters. So it's important to remember that all cellular life can and is infected by viruses that are specific to those particular types of cells. No matter what you're looking at on the planet, it has viruses. There is a very specific relationship between hosts and the viruses that infect them. And this is a relationship that is subject to evolutionary change and that is often quite ancient. In multicellular organisms, viruses may be able to infect all of our cells or only specific cells. For example, in humans, HIV can only infect cells that have CD4 proteins on them. These are the T cells that make up an important aspect of our immune system. Um, and for example, the novel SARS-CoV-2 currently circulating, it can only infect those of our cells that have the ACE2 receptor protein on them. For some viruses, we can work with them in the lab using cell culture. And for others, we have to use whole organisms. So the fact that viruses are only active when they're inside their host cells complicates their study because it means we have to grow both the host cell or an environment that closely replicates it or whole organisms in order to grow the viruses. It's much more complex than growing, for example, a bacterium where you just have to provide it with a culture medium for its needs to be met. Host virus specificity always exists, but the degree of it can vary just a little. <clears throat> for example, the SARS-CoV-2 virus can bind only to the ACE2 protein on the surface of human and presumably bat and other organisms that can host this virus cells. And as I mentioned before, HIV will only infect human T cells, and it's also specific just to humans. So SARS-CoV-2 can infect humans and other animals if the ACE2 is present on those surface, the surface of those cells. Um, whereas HIV, H is for human, human immunodeficiency virus. It's a virus that is only found in humans now. Ebola virus infects the dendritic cells of the immune system and then moves into other cells, especially the liver and the kidneys. It's another example of what is called a zoonotic uh, virus in that it can infect other things, for example, bats. How small are viruses? Maybe not as small as we used to think, but still pretty small. So for reference here, here's a sort of typical size of a eukaryotic animal cell and the diameter of it would be about 10,000 nanometers. The nucleus would be smaller, maybe a 2,800 nanometer diameter. Here's an E. coli. It's about 2,000 nanometers across this point here. And then all of these are different kinds of viruses. So bacteriophage are the viruses that can infect bacteria. 
typical size, about 95 nanometers, and they have this cool space invader structure as well. I didn't make that up. Here's an influenza virus. It's a category of viruses, but a typical influenza virus is about 100 nanometers across, smallpox about 250 nanometers across, and the beta coronaviruses, to which SARS-CoV-2, SARS, and MERS all belong, as well as the coronaviruses that routinely cause cold in human populations, the cold, the ailment known as cold, they're about 120 nanometers across. So they're actually considered to be relatively big viruses, but they're tiny compared to cells. Viruses don't grow like cells, so they don't have a typical growth curve. So instead, what we see is something called a one-step growth curve. And if you look at the progression of a viral infection in a set of host cells, it'll happen in what are called burst phases. So you'll have the virus added to the system. Maybe this is a cell culture, or maybe this is an unfortunate victim of a viral infection, human example. They're exposed to the virus. The virus adheres to and enters some cells. And then there's a latent period. And during that period in time, which is also referred to as eclipse in the viral life cycle, during that period in time, what's happening is the virus is taking over the host cell and it's forcing the host cell to replicate viral genome and viral protein. And then that new material will self-assemble <clears throat> and it will burst out of the infected host cells, often killing them as they go. And so you'll get from one virus entered, you'll get hundreds to thousands of them being released later once the virus has gone through its life cycle. And then these will go off and infect more host cells, and this whole thing will repeat. So if you were to plot this over a lot of time, you'd have a stepwise curve made up of a series of bursts. Viral structures are very geometric in nature and relatively simple compared to cell structure. So every virus is going to have a genome that is made out of RNA or DNA. And in this cartoon, that's shown as these purple stringy coiled things here, 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 and here. Every virus will also have a protein coat that is called generically the nucleocapsid. And that protein coat is shown here, it's shown here, here, and then it's shown in here as these little like yellow dots. You'll notice that it is made out of repeating units of protein, and that's so that the virus can make its nucleocapsid from only one or a couple of genes at most, and it will just repeatedly express those genes during viral infection in the viral life cycle, and then they will self-assemble and lock into place to create this coating that is called the nucleocapsid. These coatings are really pressure resistant, because the viral genome is tightly packed inside these particles in a pressurized manner, which helps the genome to sort of explode all over the host cell once infection of the host cell has been achieved. Some viruses also have a layer of membrane stolen from the host. In that case, those viruses are called enveloped viruses, whereas the ones that lack that membrane are simply called naked viruses. <clears throat> Viruses often have spike proteins associated with them, and they are important in a variety of functions, including attachment of the virus to the host cell. And the SARS-CoV-2 virus currently circulating has spike proteins on it that look much like this. It is also an enveloped virus, looks very, very similar to this. Here's an electron micrograph of a bacteriophage, specifically a bacteriophage that is called T4. And they have this beautiful morphology, very space invader looking like. The genome is encapsulated here. All of this is the nucleocapsid, but they also have a protein structure called the tail that's complete with these little spiky things down here called an end plate and tail pins and fibers. And this would attach to the surface of a bacterial host cell that has a specific receptor protein allowing this T4 bacteriophage to land, attach, and then it will actually inject its genome through the tail and the tail pin and the end plate into the bacterial host cell. A little bit different than the animal viruses 
which are actually taken up and brought into the cell and then release their genome. The viral genomes can be very diverse. For example, they can be circular, linear, segmented, or gapped. And we won't get into that too much here, but just be aware that there's some diversity in the shape and the organization. They can be made out of DNA or RNA, and that DNA or RNA can be double-stranded or single-stranded. In the case of RNA viruses, Single-stranded RNA viruses can be plus sense or negative sense, which I will get to in a minute, but in short, plus sense means the viral genome has the exact same base sequence as that of the viral messenger RNA that will be translated. In other words, it can be directly translated by the host cell ribosomes, whereas minus sense would need to be copied over into plus sense before it could be translated. So that sense term can be really confusing, and if you're using it in the context of DNA, then we're referring to double-stranded DNA in, a, in something, some creature that has a DNA genome, and the antisense strand and the sense strand refer to what gets transcribed and then ultimately translated. Antisense gets transcribed, and sense strand has the same sequence except for U's get swapped for T's as the messenger RNA. <clears throat> in the messenger RNA world, if we're talking about positive sense RNA, it can be directly translated by ribosomes to make protein. If we're talking about negative sense RNA, then that RNA has to be copied or transcribed into the positive strand before it can be translated. Okay, So coronaviruses fall into this category up here. Their genome can be directly translated to get protein. This sense idea has all sorts of relevance. It is confusing, but it's worth paying a little attention to because it also is important in understanding gene regulation in eukaryotes. So a lot of the regulatory RNA that we use to regulate gene expression in eukaryotes relies on this idea of complementary or opposite sense RNA in order to block or facilitate translation, something I've mentioned at other times in, in uh, information with you. So viruses can be classified in many different ways. They can be classified according to the disease they cause. For example, measles causes measles disease. They can be classified or named according to where they were first identified. The Ebola virus is an example of that. And the Ebola is a, is a river in, uh, in Africa where the Ebola virus was first identified. It can be, they can be named according to who discovered them, like Epstein-Barr virus or their morphology, so coronaviruses have a, a, a corona radiating around their, surf, their surface, like a sun-like or star-like um, morphology, hence the name. We could name them according to the body tissues that, that uh, they affect, so a neurotropic virus affects the neurosystem. Poliovirus can do that. A respiratory virus affects the respiratory system, so this is like a useful category or way to describe viruses from a medical perspective when you're interested in the effect that they have on hosts. Or, and more useful, we can categorize them according to their genome structure and their mode of replication. Especially useful in this is something called the Baltimore system. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Before I do that, here is a very basic viral um, life cycle. So in a basic viral life cycle, what happens is it's the goal of the virus to make more. So it's the goal of the virus to go from one viral particle to many viral particles. What are viruses made out of? They're made out of protein, and they're made out of um, some sort of genome, RNA or, D or DNA. So you want to copy those and then make more viral particles or virions and then release them. That's their point. Okay, It's their whole raison d'etre. So the virus or the viral particle will attach specifically to a host in a stage called attachment or adsorption. It will get its genome inside the host cell, either by injecting it if it's a bacteriophage, or in the case of an animal or plant virus, it'll be taken up into the host cell, and then the capsid will dissolve or be removed, releasing the viral genome. Once the viral genome is inside the host cell, then you get replication of viral genome and protein. 
they self-assemble or package. And once all those particles form, they burst out of the host cell, often destroying the host cell as they go, which is part of why you get, for example, a sore throat in the case of infection with respiratory viruses. The Baltimore classification system takes advantage of the role of messenger RNA as central to understanding how viruses work and how they replicate. All viruses have to make messenger RNA so they can make viral protein. And they all need to make protein in order to be able to make new viruses. So the Baltimore system of classification looks at what the structure of the viral genome is. Here, DS is for double-stranded, and SS is for single-stranded, and plus or minus is for positive or negative sense, and I defined that a moment ago. The, the currently circulating SARS-CoV-2 falls into the class four of the Baltimore system of classification, and it's a plus sense class four. So it makes this plus sense single-stranded RNA. That is its base germ. If we stick to the coronavirus piece, okay, so a coronavirus is a plus sense single-stranded RNA virus. It's a class four, and it can be used directly as messenger RNA, and therefore that messenger RNA can be directly translated to make viral proteins like viral, like RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, or the spike proteins that make up coronavirus shells or nucleocapsids. Those class four viruses also need to make more genome, and they do that in a two-step process where their, their single sense or their, uh, their positive sense RNA genome is transcribed to a negative sense RNA genome, which is then transcribed back into a positive sense uh, molecule for replication purposes. Any RNA virus needs an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, or RDRP. So this is a viral protein that allows the virus to make RNA from RNA. So RNA is the template, and, and it is used to make more RNA. And this gets shortened often to the acronym RDRP in the common literature. So this is a viral protein encoded by a viral gene. And I encourage you to take a look at the Wikipedia page that I have uh, posted to my website to get a little bit more information about the currently circulating SARS-CoV-2. And with that, I'm going to conclude this lecture.